the second session uh, we have titled how do transformations happen and it links uh, of course hopefully <laughs> of course well with the first one we, we've set the big picture and, and one of the things I do want to say about the first session is uh, to reiterate what was already said, you get the big picture, but you look at the two works that were presented, and they are actually very, very data intensive, and 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 sort of the the visioning is built on uh, very thorough and, and uh, rigorous uh, analysis of the data. And in keeping in that tradition, what we want to do in this session is to start from that big picture and now dig a little deeper. Uh, not at the entirety of the pictures, but key elements of the picture. And in this session, we'll do uh, three, we have three speakers. We have uh, Professor Ozanov from Public Health here at Boston University, talking about public health. We have John Haga from the Population Reference Bureau, who will talk about the demographic transition, population. And then Cutler Cleveland, also from Boston University, who will be talking about energy. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Ozanov. Uh, from the uh, Professor of Environmental Health at the Department of, uh, at the School of Public Health here at, at, at Boston University. I won't go through his very, very illustrious career, but uh, mainly to say that we are extremely happy that he is here with us and he will be talking about public health in a time of great transition. All yours, sir. Well, thank you. You're probably happier than I am after having to follow Paul uh, at the podium here. I, I'm tempted to say, uh, yeah, it's a hard act to follow, but about two years ago I was at a, a meeting and uh, a speaker got up and said, uh, there's two acts that you never want to follow. One is the, uh, at the circus. One is the clown and one is the elephant. That's right. So the next day I got up, and, right, well, <laughs> that, that, that's, this is where the story goes. The next day I, got a, I gave a talk. It was, I had my PowerPoints and everything. I told a couple of jokes. It was something I knew pretty well. The next speaker gets up and says, oh, Dave Ozanoff has a hard act to follow. And my graduate student leans over to me and says, are you the clown or the elephant? So uh, I, I actually never got an answer to that question. But, uh, I don't have any PowerPoints for you. I was at a meeting, uh, although uh, you know, I'm from the medical profession, we always have PowerPoints. I was at a meeting a couple of years ago at, at a very illustrious venue. And there were four of us, three epidemiologists, I'm an epidemiologist, and a lawyer. And we all, all the epidemiologists had PowerPoints, and the lawyer didn't have any PowerPoints. And his explanation was, it's not that he doesn't understand that a picture is worth a thousand words, it's just that he prefers a thousand words. <laughs> uh, so what you're going to get, actually, is, uh, is my thousand words. Um, uh, when Cutler asked me to, to, uh, to do this, at first I said no, uh, and then he sent me a description of this program. I said, well, gee, it's sort of tempting, all right? So you, everybody knows what happens when you yield to temptation. Uh, and so you're going to be inf inflicted with uh, that uh, sin of mine. But uh, it was actually a subject that I had never thought about before. I, I know a fair amount about public health, having been in medicine public health for 40 years now. Um, but I hadn't, all of my work had, to do with immediate problems. Families who lost loved ones from cancer, for example, they want, want to know why it happened. What happens when they're exposed to this chemical? Um, uh, how do we prevent this from happening in the future? Very much here and now, and to have somebody ask you uh, to talk about um, the uh, longer range future, uh, first was a very enticing uh, prospect. And then when I agreed to do it and actually got into it, it became quite daunting. Uh, I, I guess the best I can say is that what you're going to hear is me thinking out loud. It's, it's not a pretty picture. Uh, and, um, and trying to think, what, uh, what would I say to my public health colleagues about this? This is really a subject that public health hasn't grappled with at all. We haven't thought at all about uh, the next 30 or 40 years. Uh, we thought about tomorrow, and often we think about what happened uh, a month ago or 20 years ago to cause the problems that are, are happening today. But, but what's going to happen 40 years from now is really not on our agenda. Um, so uh, one way to think about my talk today is, uh, you know, what should we say in public health? How, how should we talk to each other uh, prior to the crisis in 2015? Uh, and I think there's a great deal that we can do, uh, and especially since I, it's, in my view, public health is headed exactly in the wrong direction right now. If it is true, I think, as, as uh, many people, and not only in this room but elsewhere, believe that we're on the threshold of some kind of a fundamental transformation to a planetary society, and I will give some public health reasons why I think that's true, it's at least also true, as Paul said, that the consequences and shape of that transformation remain uh, very uncertain. Uh, my task here is to 
discuss what uh, the public health perspective on that and what we can learn from public health. And one question you might ask is, why would anybody interested, be interested in what lessons we can learn from public health in the first place? So first let me begin with a conventional distinction, but I think a useful one, uh, between public health and clinical medicine. In clinical medicine, we deal with people one at a time. We deal with individuals. Uh, and in public health, we deal with groups of people, or groups of groups of people, or groups of groups of people. For example, a country is a group of a group of people, say, a, a group of states, which in turn are a group of cities, which in turn are a group of neighborhoods, and so forth. This is, in fact, uh, a, a crucial distinction. A clin clinician may have very little interest in, uh, in exposure that carries a risk of one in 100,000 to his patient. Uh, as an individual, but a public health uh, official uh, might have a great deal of interest uh, if there are tens or even millions of people exposed to that same chemical. The public nature of public health is important in, in another way as well, because uh, the enterprises of public health uh, are public enterprises. They're pertinent to whole communities or groups of communities or groups of groups of communities. And they're also planned and they're organized. So the question of what we can learn in, in affecting transitions or transformations, uh, at least theoretically, has some pertinence. Uh, unfortunately, public health in this country is, as I said, I think taking exactly the wrong direction um, with respect to its essential mission uh, or what its essential mission would be in a planetary uh, society. And while the the change that's occurring in public health now is typical of the kinds of periodic change that, uh, that happen routinely in public health. It's happening at a very inopportune time. Uh, and it's happening a great deal of influence elsewhere. Uh, what's happening in the United States is not just something that, that's happening to the United States, but through our uh, gross influence is happening lots of other places as well. Uh, let me begin by just looking back over about 150 years uh, to, to sort of get a longer view of what's brought us to this pass, uh, and uh, perhaps by some historical accident to the confrontation between where public health is headed and I, what uh, I believe circumstances require. Uh, public health in the latter half of the 19th century, not the previous one but the one before that, was also concerned with human populations, but it also had another uh, major concern, and that was with the social conditions of those populations. If the early public health activists, the, the second half of the 19th century, uh, were rarely Marxist, they did, in fact, share with Marxists some presuppositions, and one of them was a belief that human nature was a function of social relations and could be altered by altering those social relations. Having said that, the solutions of public health reformers were very un-Marxist. Um, while they and Marxists fought to clean up filthy cities and to stop businesses from fouling and polluting water and food, public health reformers did so in the, in a, in the belief that a, a moral way of life was a precondition for health uh, and was impossible in conditions of filth and poverty. And their goal, therefore, was to convince the poor uh, that to adopt moral lifestyles, which not too coincidentally coincided with American middle class standards. This uh, morally uh, explicit view um, of public health reform was extremely fragile. In fact, it disintegrated relatively quickly uh, in the years between 1890 and 1920. And there were several things that uh, coincided to bring about a disintegration of the, this view. Um, one of them uh, was uh, the new science of bacteriology and the germ theory, and it's tremendously potent and explanatory and operational power. Germ theory really made it uh, unnecessary for morality to keep a water supply clean because you could do it with chlorine. Uh, uh, Value-free science, therefore, stepped in and, and took the place of, of the moral reformer, and it allowed the progressive era's technocratic solutions to take a sort of a disintegrating, fractured society and make it, or try to make it whole again. At the same time that reform, moral reform was sort of falling apart, there were also major shifts in the political organization, the medical profession. Um, and they profoundly influenced public health. There's a reason why I'm going through this history, and I, you'll see it in a minute, I hope. Uh, unlike today, uh, doctoring uh, then at the turn of the 20th century was a very low status, a faction-ridden, um, highly competitive uh, profession where practitioners, most practitioners, really eked out a marginal living. 
Uh, that changed around the turn of the century when the American Medical Association reorganized, uh, inaugurating not only a spectacular era of growth for the, Ameri the medical profession, but also uh, it enabled them to take political control uh, of the profession, both its education and its lic licensure. Um, and from that point on, medicine became a self-regulating uh, profession. They could say who practiced it and, um, and how they practiced it. These two events, the eclipse of the social reformer in public health and the rise of organized medicine, took place also in years of tremendous tumult and social upheaval in this country. There was a panic in 1907 that lasted almost to, up to America's uh, entry into World War I in 1917. Uh, and it was accompanied with uh, very uh, highly publicized uh, episodes of labor and anti-labor violence. Uh, for example, uh, the uh, 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 union organizers uh, dynamited the Los Angeles Times building in 1914, and almost the same year, company thugs uh, murdered a bunch of innocent men, women, and children at Rockefeller's uh, Colorado uh, uh, Fuel and, uh, and Iron Company. Uh, in the Ludlow Massacre. In 1910, where I grew up uh, in Milwaukee, they elected a socialist mayor. In fact, when I grew up, there was a socialist mayor in Milwaukee, still alive. Uh, and um, it's 72 cities followed suit and hired, uh, um, elected socialists within two years of that. Uh, the, the Wobblies were organizing throughout the West. There were major textile strikes in Patterson, uh, New Jersey, uh, and, um, and Lowell. Uh, and I think if you were to look around then, um, what you would see, what, what you would feel was that the society was sort of coming apart and lots of dangerous elements were on the loose. Now all of this, these three things happening, the social milieu, the reorganization of the medical profession and the, the uh, demise of uh, moral reform had a tremendous and an important effect in the 20th century on public health. Uh, and one of the most striking of those was to facilitate a conceptual relocation of where disease came from and where ill health came from, away from da a dangerous environment and uh, towards dangerous people. It was dangerous people uh, who ultimately uh, were the cause of not only of social unrest but of disease. And the image was really dramatically condensed in the figure of Typhoid Mary, who was a, an uh, immigrant Irish cook who uh, infected upper class households in Oyster Bay, Long Island by her, uh, the fact that she was a healthy typhoid carrier. The change in attitude that this produced was really very dramatic. You can see within the space of a few years looking at the public health literature how much it changes. I'll just give you one sentence from one of the most influential practitioners of that emerging new public health, Hibbert Hill in Minnesota. It says, the, uh, the old public health was concerned with environment. The new is concerned with the in individual. The old sought the sources of infectious disease in the surroundings of man. The new finds them in man himself. Uh, <clears throat> This, uh, what, when the reformers of the 19th century left public health, where did they go? Uh, they went to the conservation movement. Right? The way they handled the whole question of um, class division and class warfare was to uh, empty uh, the world of people uh, and move to the wilderness. And so they left public health. Uh, uh, now empty of reformers, uh, and left it to the new sort of technocratic scientists, uh, who now sought the, the, uh, the origins of the disease in individual people. And this had a very unanticipated effect. And the, the effect was to put public health under the thumb of a newly dominant medical profession. Remember, clinical medicine has to do with people. Public health now redefined itself as controlling not only people, but dangerous and irresponsible people. Uh, at the same time. And the result was that uh, a very uh, politically powerful profession, which was medicine, completely dominated public health and relegated it to a marginal, very low status uh, profession, uh, discipline. Now, a lot of people today, and I think almost all of my colleagues in public health, uh, certainly those who are younger than I am, would find this a really unrecognizable view of public health. Uh, but it does, in fact, describe the situation of public health when I came into medicine in, in the early 1960s. Uh, then public, if you went in, you said you were going into public health, it meant that you were going to be reading TV films in the South Bronx for very uh, low pay. Uh, but that's not the public health that we know and not the public health of most of my professional career. 
uh, public health um, now is considered a form of social engagement. Uh, public health since that time um, really reacquired in a, in a major way a moral vision, uh, one that informed also a political vision. And all of this was a result of the uh, upheavals of the 1960s, which brought a whole lot of very bright new young people into the public health uh, as a form of, uh, of social expression, as a way of uh, work, having their values and their workplace uh, coincide with each other. And that's been what public health has been like for the last 30 years. It's been a wonderful place to work. Um, it's a, a place where you could sort of work out your values uh, at the same time that you felt that you were doing something decent and, and have a great career at the same time. Now, the reason I'm I'm making a big deal about this change uh, that came over public health in my lifetime. There's two reasons for it. One of them is to remind ourselves of the obvious thing, which is our experience of public health is, belongs to a specific historical moment. And the other one is a little more melancholy, which is to make the point that, like the romantic reformers of the late 19th century, our era of public health is, is gone. And the evidence is everywhere um, that um, uh, we're at the end of an era. We're being marginalized by having our resources cut. Our prestige is threatened by the appointment of uh, leaders whose main qualification seems to be they're ineffective. And then, and then we have a new science, just like we had bacteriology 100 years ago. We now have the Human Genome Project. And what the Human Genome Project is doing is resituating disease back inside individuals, inside individuals' genes. Uh, at the same time, uh, in the wake of uh, September 11th, we're seeing the entire field of public health reorganized along military lines uh, as a, a, we call it emergency response. But what it really is is a, is a hierarchically organized and militarized system whose priorities are incredibly distorted um, and often serve uh, national foreign policy. For Consider the recent smallpox vaccination program, and I'd be glad to elaborate at length on that, but I don't think I need to. We're again focusing on dangerous individuals. So where are we headed? I have one view graph here. Um, is this just another cycle? Uh, yeah, it's another cycle in public health, but it's coming at a very bad time. Uh, consider the following graphs. There's two of them here. The top one um, shows the period between 1850 and uh, the year 2000. And uh, the red line on the left is the amount of time it takes to circumnavigate the globe. And the green line is the rise in uh, world population from a few hundred billion up to six billion, where we are now. Uh, the lower one shows an almost doubling in uh, infectious disease uh, in the last 20 years. Now, a lot of that, of course, is AIDS. But AIDS uh, is uh, one of the, the whole set of new emerging diseases that we're experiencing. Uh, in the developed countries. Um, that includes SARS, it includes Legionnaire's disease, it includes West Nile encephalitis, uh, and a number of others. So what's happening here? Uh, is what's going on in the last 20 years with the increase in, in mortality from infectious disease, despite massive, you know, amazing in improvements in pharmaceutical science, is that just a matter of degree, or is something uh, more fundamental going on here? And um, you know, since Paul went into this uh, at some length, I'll, I'll summarize what I have at greater length here in, in my written paper. But one possibility, and I think uh, the, the one that's happening, is that the pattern of social relationships of our species is undergoing uh, a phase transition. Uh, phase transitions, as he said, are things like these tipping points, like when, when water, if you cool it sufficiently enough, turns, to, becomes a, from a uh, disorganized liquid to a highly organized crystal, which we call ice or metals become paramagnetic and, and things like that. Uh, and it turns out that the same quantitative relationships uh, describe other things, like complicated networks, like the internet. These complex networks aren't connected randomly. They're not like a road system. They're more like the airline route systems, where uh, a couple of big hubs handle most of the traffic, and a lot of thousands, the thousands of little airports handle very little of it. Uh, OK. I didn't get the message this was supposed to be a 20-minute talk, so uh, um, I'm going to be amputating large sections of it uh, as I go along. Uh, one of the things that happens in a phase transition uh, is that um, the 
individuals sort of disappear in a scale-free way. So uh, in, instead of seeing how individuals are connected to other individuals in a social network, for example, a transmission of infectious disease, if you then near a phase transition, if you put a box around a groups of connected individuals and then connect them, you reproduce the pattern. And if you put boxes around those and, re and look at the pattern, you again see the same pattern all over again. That's what happens at a phase transition. Uh, and uh, that's what we're seeing in infectious disease, which is that uh, continents are infecting each other just the way countries are infecting each other, just the way cities are infecting each other, and just the way individuals are infecting each other. Um, I've cut short this uh, description a little bit, but I'd be glad to elaborate on it later. Uh, at the same time, uh, we are destroying our public health system. And our public health system is moving in the direction of uh, what uh, Paul would call fortress world. Right? We're adopting policies in public health that um, are um, um, command and control type policies rather than nurturant um, uh, policies of uh, interdependence and support. So the way we're going to deal with uh, epidemics is by uh, quarantining people, by travel restrictions, by draconian measures for people who disobey them. And we've seen this not just in the United States, but in China and uh, in Asia where the SARS epidemic uh, uh, really disrupted economic activity in a major way. But that's not, uh, I'm, I've just, uh, dumped five pages of my text in the hopper here. Uh, that's not where we need to go if we are making a transition to a planetary society. Um, what, if we are in fact embedded in a system, a highly interconnected system, uh, we need to recognize uh, essentially the new reality of public health, which is that no community is safe unless we're all safe. No single person is safe unless everybody is safe. Uh, and the positive promotion of community well-being, both our communities and of other communities, uh, is a widely shared goal, not just in public health, but uh, in, in many other uh, sectors of civil society as well and around the world. And we labor at that goal of making our community safe and other communities safe with lots of other people that we don't think of as being part of public health. And let me just give you a few surprising examples. The hospitality in the food industry, that is hotels and restaurants, social workers, utility workers, garbage collectors, transportation workers, communication workers, and many, many more. Those are all people who are doing exactly the same thing that we're doing in public health, trying to make our community safe and other communities safe. And we need to enlarge the scope of public health uh, to embrace that, uh, that common goal. And there are a, a variety of reasons for doing it. Some of them are practical, but some of them are, are uh, much more, I would say, maybe uh, ideological. Uh, and probably the most important is that it encourages, which is to say that it nurtures the best instincts that many people have, uh, even though they don't think of themselves as public health workers, but uh, who alongside a lot of their more mundane interests of getting ahead or paying the rent or defending their turf or simultaneously, perhaps contradictorily, are interested in, in fact, very much desirous of helping and contributing to the community. Shortly after the September 11th attacks, uh, I began to, to, uh, to try and organize a new kind of public health institution. Uh, and uh, I, again, on the basis that, uh, that the internet and other more means of communication had broken down lots of the barriers that we had before, uh, I, I thought uh, what we could do is to bring together uh, lots of disparate kinds of knowledge to solve practical problems. So scientists who are studying infectious disease spread and scholars who are studying the spread of rumors could be brought together with journalists and anthropologists and sociologists to consider how information uh, flow to and from the public uh, occurred in emergencies. Uh, transportation engineers could get together with taxi drivers. I mean, if you want to get say, bandages from one end of the city to the other. Who knows how to do that? It's a taxi driver. It's not a transportation engineer, all right? Uh, and get ventilation engineers and meteorologists together to, you know, look at the, you know, spread of uh, agents and buildings. These are just a few obvious possibilities. And uh, there was a pretty good buy-in, I think, from a lot of the universities around here. We had a collaborative, a public health collaborative going, uh, and it disappeared, it fell apart, essentially, when, when uh, the feeding frenzy, which was instigated by the Bush administration and Congress, took over the individual interests of the ins institutions, and they all went scrambling after Homeland Security money uh, by themselves. And what that did is it abandoned a whole lot of people who with genuinely good instincts, who found themselves with no way to contribute to, uh, to making a, a better world except to go shopping. 
That was uh, the suggestion from the administration. And instead of adopting a, uh, a language and a vision of nurturance, the, co the country retreated into a bunker mentality. Um, I, I'm out of time here, but l let me just sketch a couple of ideas, or one idea in particular of how we could move forward uh, in public health. And this is a dialogue that we have to have in public health now. These are things that we've not thought about before. And um, one of the things I'm very grateful to this, you know, the fact that I made the mistake of saying I would give this paper, is that for the very first time, um, I think there's an opportunity to start talking about the longer range feature in public health, something that we've never really done before. Uh, but one of the things that we should do is recognize that uh, just as the, one of the most widely uh, admired groups and humanitarian groups is Médecins Sans Frontières, they're doctors without borders, that medic public health is also without borders. Uh, we understand this intellectually in public health, uh, and uh, we know that's what makes public health a global enterprise. And we also understand it as scientists. We know that race and ethnicity are social categories. They're not biological ones. But unfortunately, we often don't act on that understanding, and we often don't talk in the right way. Uh, as a matter of public health content, what we should be doing is actively working against and continually cognizant of the kinds of words, ideas, and policies that we're using, especially those that foster any kind of nationalism or tribalism. And for starters, that means opposing any kind of coercive force in the furtherance of political ends, either by nation states or others. And now let me, just to finish, because um, it's in my nature to do so, make a point that's deliberately provocative. Um, and with a proviso that you understand that I'm being extreme uh, and, uh, and apologize in advance if anybody takes any offense here. But we are unfortunately beset by all kinds of tribalisms and nationalisms today, and some of them are even advanced by us um, and perpetrated with some good intentions uh, of empowering those who are disenfranchised and promoting tolerance and understanding. And I'm talking here about the celebration of diversity because too often they become celebrations of differences, and they have the effect of emphasizing differences which set people apart from each other. This is a very unpopular view in my neck of the, my, the progressive public health point of view, and um, I, I understand that it's a little bit of a caricature, but I want to say it anyway. Um, we can use words in public health that uh, recognize and presuppose that there are many human families. And there are, and there are lots of contexts in which that makes a great deal of sense. Or we can use words that presuppose, even though it's not always true in some contexts, that there's only one human family. And for starters, one thing we can do, uh, given the right context, uh, is um, always emphasize the one that makes most sense from, the, from public health in a global society, which is talk about one human family. And only to the extent necessary, discuss how people are different from each other. People are different, they're unique, and their individuality is incredibly important. But from the public health point of view, I think it's going to become extremely important in the future that we emphasize um, how, how much we all have in common, rather than things that set us apart. Um, well, uh, Forty years ago, Marshall McLuhan wrote that uh, the new electronic interdependence recreates the world in the image of a global village. Uh, and we finally arrived at the point that he foresaw. The problem is we don't always know where we are, and we don't always know how to speak the language uh, where we've arrived. Uh, I suggest that we'd better get our bearings straight pretty quick, or we're really going to be truly lost. Thank you very much. We, we're going to take all three presentations together and have a question and answer session at the end of the three in the interest of time. Uh, and, and thank you very much, David. The next speaker. Uh, is John Haga, who's going to, uh, who's from the Population uh, Reference Bureau, and he's going to talk about the demographic transition, instinct, byproduct, or by design. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, everyone who is responsible for organizing this. It's uh, uh, one of the complaints, and I have the same one David did, is you sit down and you think, this, this was a great assignment. I'd love to do this. Um, and then you sit down and tr start doing it, and you think your topic is, is just much too vast. There's, there's much too much to say about this. Um, and, and then you realize this is a good thing, to pull away from doing your job, come on a, a crisp fall day in Boston in good company, and, and really think, what is it that, that you think you're doing? 
And in my case, this allowed me to put uh, really my last three jobs into some perspective. Now, I, I can't complain in this company that my topic was too vast because I noticed that Paul had everything that I know about uh, and, and have tried to work on in my whole career in one word on one of his slides. And so I, I, this is not the right gang to, uh, to say it's too much. Um, could you, thanks Libby, could you put the next one on? I'm going to try to pick up on some points relevant to the question that Cutler set us, particularly whether and how we change demographic regimes through a combination of collective action and uh, individual choices. Uh, I'll speak first about the transition uh, and then about its two component parts, uh, mortality and, uh, and fertility declines. Uh, is the end in sight? I'd like to discuss the possibility of reversals, and, and David helped very much by, uh, by launching into uh, to one of those. We sometimes reify the, this transition and, and forget the possibility, the real possibility of backtracking. Uh, and also the great interest that should attend, uh, but usually doesn't, speculation on how fast populations will re reach their presumed stable end state. And lastly, I'm going to draw out a couple points that might not quite make it as lessons for everybody else, but, but should provide analogies for, for some other uh, transitions. Peter, you raised the, the question earlier of what makes people happy or, or uh, you know, how fiendishly difficult this is. Well, there, there's, there's something as I get older myself, I just turned 50, and, and that is practically universal is that nearly everyone's answer to that in, in all societies has something to do with uh, uh, long life and people dying in the correct order, the generations dying in the correct order. Uh, there's, there's really nothing more basic than, and it's not universal, of course, we all know people for whom the generations have died in the wrong order. But it used to be the biblical promise of your three score years and ten was hopelessly uh, uh, unrealistic for the great majority of, of human existence. It's, it's only recently, it's only in my lifetime that this has been democratized. This has spread really throughout the world. Everybody just about has a legitimate hope now of seeing their children grow up and of uh, seeing some of the lifetime of their grandchildren and, and having people die in the correct order. Now first, the, the classic model of the demographic transition. Demographers are interested in a lot of transitions. We could talk about urbanization sometime. We might as well say it's right about now today. For the first time ever, people living in villages and hamlets are no longer the majority of the world's people. So urbanization has we're, we're, we're bang in the middle of uh, a, a huge transition. But the same way that comedian Letty Bruce always said, there's only one the church. Uh, there's only to us really one the demographic transition. And this is the way it was classically described by Frank Notstein and others uh, uh, shortly after World War II in highly stylized form. Is that in uh, focus there? Can you see? It's basically crude birth rates um, on the top, uh, crude death rates on the bottom, crude meaning no age standardization, no allowance for the fact that the age composition of a population changes tremendously as you move through this. We know that through most of his human history, populations grew very slowly. And this is an important point. Most of our familial institutions, most, most economy, most tradition, was worked out in a, a, a long tradition when populations didn't grow fast. The transition begins when mortality rates start to fall, a sustained fall. The gap between these two rates is very simply interpretable. It's the natural rate of growth of a population. Usually we express it as rates per thousand, divide it by 10, and that's the gap is the, is the percentage rate of growth at, at any instant of a population, barring, uh, abstracting from immigration. Some of the early writers on the transition distinguish two or three middle stages, that middle one, stage two, where the rate of growth is increasing, and the second one, stage three there, where the rate of growth is decreasing. 
but they, the, what they have in common is the early state with high mortality, high fertility rates, around typically 40 to 50 per thousand per year, uh, and little population growth, and a late stage, an end stage, with low crude fertility, low crude mortality, around 10 per thousand per year, and, and again, virtually no population growth. All of the interest is in how long and, 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 and how painful is that middle stage. Could you do the next one? I had some in the paper about the, um, uh, the way this idea was worked out. It was remarkably prescient. Uh, the, the Frank Notstein and others had very little actual information on historic or contemporary uh, demographic transition when they worked out that model. Um, it's the exact opposite of Malthus. It proved to be not a very good model for what had happened in Europe and North America, but amazingly prescient about what was about to happen in the what we now call the third world. Uh, that's the exact opposite of Malthus. Besides naming the transition, demographers have sought to explain the pace and interrelation of the two declines, and there's a lot of theory and, and interesting stuff to say about that. Now, no country looked exactly like the stylized model. This shows uh, birth and death rates over a long period from about 1875 till, till yesterday for the U.S. and Mexico. And there's two things, the uh, top line, the solid line is uh, birth rates, and the dotted line is death rates, uh, and red is Mexico and blue is the U.S. Uh, and, and the reason I chose these two is, is that, that they're actually fairly typical in one sense. Two features of the graph. One is that the time scales are different. The transition that took nearly two centuries for the United States, and the U.S. was well along in these transitions at the point I'm starting, uh, happened in a couple of decades for Mexico. Uh, everything's on fast forward in the developing countries in, in demography. The, the countries that started the transition early had slower transitions. The U.S. was actually one of the, the first countries to have uh, the fertility decline begin. Uh, the, the other was France, and, and think about what those two had in common in the late, uh, late 18th century. The second point is that the gap between the two rates never got that big for the early starters. The gap between the two rates is the percentage rate of growth of the population, a uh, very, very simple arithmetic relation. It never got all that huge for the early starters. For the third world countries in this century, the gap uh, got to be huge in many times, many times 3 4% per year. And you think about what is 4% growth that then, you know, you wouldn't be that happy if you've been in, the, if your uh, 401k was getting 4% a year. But it means doubling in 18 years. That's a gigantic strain, doubling in less than a generation if that rate of growth is sustained. It's a gigantic strain on, on all kinds of social uh, uh, institutions. Now, there's some interesting points about the, the timing of, of the mortality transition which, uh, in fact, there's interesting points about the timing of the fertility transition. Uh, uh, David mentioned the public health reformers. Um, in many countries, the, the, uh, the, the transition is, is before even those. In all countries, it's before clinical medicine did much good. The famous uh, characterization by uh, the Welsh guy, live, sorry. Uh, McEwen, of course, but um, the average encounter of the average patient with the average physician did more harm than good until about World War II. So, so that that's the remove encounters with doctors as an explanation for mortality decline until quite recently. There's a wonderful. Uh, Historically, in Europe, there was no clear sequence of mortality and fertility decline, and uh, the, a lot of historical research has been sort of knocking down every easy explanation you could come up with for what triggers uh, particularly fertility decline. It's practically a parlor. We could do improv or something that you could toss one out, like the Industrial Revolution or urbanization or women working outside the home, and I'll give you three examples 
of significant countries where the alleged precondition was not in place before the, uh, uh, the transition started. Can we, Tim? This shows the trends in life expectancy in the last five minutes, okay. Trends in life expectancy uh, by regions in um, the last 30 years or so. You can see it's, it's grown everywhere. Uh, international differentials have closed. Uh, the, this, this is very regional. Uh, a much more chaotic graph would be, uh, would be individual countries, and an even more chaotic graph would be culture groups and ethnic groups. Um, but this, this is uh, uh, an important uh, trip. Could we show the next one? The second point I want to make about the transition is the incredible speed of the transition. Now, this, this shows crude death rates at age, and uh, you, more commonly people use a logarithmic scale, but, but I, I prefer uh, this one. The top graph is the U.S., the year my father was born. Uh, the middle graph is Kenya 20 years ago. Uh, and the bottom one is the U.S. Uh, quite recently, late 90s. The mortality rates have fallen at every age, particularly at the earliest stages, and that's that's been the the, the huge uh, influence in the in the infant <coughs> mortality rates. I sometimes talk to people the the about the life expectancy that and the range compared to current conditions now. When my father was born in in Tennessee. Infant mortality was 124 per thousand. Life expectancy at birth for men was about 53 years. That's about the equivalent of Ghana or Togo now. Um, when I was born, uh, 53, infant mortality was 35 per thousand. Life expectancy, it was very comparable to Egypt now. Uh, when my oldest son was born in 1980, infant mortality 14, life expectancy about 70 years, equivalent to Jamaica now. So my father, Ghana and Togo, West Africa, me, North Africa, my son, the Caribbean, now much better. These, these changes that we talk about are not time immemorial, they're in my dad's lifetime. He lived to see all of this in the U.S. People in developing countries uh, it's much more rapid. I, I, early in my career, I used to work on surveys, and, and it was fascinating. You could, you could talk with older women in Malaysia who, who were describing the start of their married life in conditions much like contemporary Africa, and you could talk to their younger daughters who were living with rates that were very similar to those we had in Washington, D.C. Thanks. Can I have the next one? Explanations, um, and I'll, I'll work quickly on this. Jack Caldwell discussed uh, some of the, uh, the early, uh, what triggered mortality decline, and a lot of it had to do with government and law and order. We talked about our government's important. The answer was they certainly used to be. Uh, Jack Caldwell uh, says, for most of human history, the chief explanation for mortality decline has been good government in the sense of strong governments that kept the peace suppressed internal disorder and violence, avoided or mitigated famine, and attempted to mitigate the worst excesses of epidemics. Much of it was conscious. Uh, the famous British famine codes in India, for example, uh, spelling out precisely how a district officer was to recognize incipient famine and the steps to be taken to mitigate it. And this was actually a successor to uh, the duties laid out in the Babunama by the Mughal Empire emperors. The British had railroads, though, which is perhaps their greatest contribution to public health in South Asia. Earlier than one used to realize, governments, especially in the English-speaking world, were taking an active interest in healthy child rearing. Now, David, we, the, you, you mentioned that phase around 1890s when they got out of um, moral uh, uh, emphasis in public health. That was, that was a time of uh, Tata Scotchpaul and others at Harvard have talked about the great maternalistic reforms. The, the best-selling government publication was Infant Care, sold, sold 10 million copies before World War II. 
there was quite a lot of uh, quite useful work on, on what to do about getting children through these dangerous ages. Um, remember, it's all much faster in the 20th century for developing countries. Again, Jack Caldwell has traced how this has worked uh, in some case studies called Roots to Low Mortality. Briefly, educated mothers expect and get proper service and use it to their advantage. They use all the things that are out there going. Education differentials. Child mortality was not much related to mother's education back in the late 19th century in America. It's a hugely, there's a huge difference in contemporary transitions in developing countries. Part of the reason is that in the old days, education didn't allow you to do much. There was no useful stuff out there that you could use for either for family planning or for child survival. Now there is, and educated people in all these countries have a huge advantage. International collective action has been terribly important, and Sakiko yesterday mentioned uh, EPI. It's one example I'd just like to put out there. A spectacular success, um, immunization, more generally control of infectious diseases. Around 1974, when the expanded program on immunization was launched, about 5% of children in developing countries were fully immunized. By the 1990s, uh, it's more than 80% for all the target ch diseases for children. Uh, only tetanus toxoid for pregnant women has lagged. Uh, I lived in Bangladesh for, for much of their great EPI expansion. I used to amaze audiences there by, by just casually saying that you realize that the rates of full immunization for children in Rajshahi district are, are considerably above what they are in Washington, D.C., where, where I uh, come from. Uh, the trick there, of course, any American realizes is Washington, D.C. is a mess in, in public health terms, but they didn't know that. That's the, got them, that woke them up. Um, now, the fertility transition, could I talk a bit about that? Around 1980, about half of the world's population lived in, in countries where total fertility rates, the average number of children a woman would, woman would bear in her lifetime at current rates, was four or more, about half were in that situation, 1980. About 16% of the world's population lived in countries where total fertility was below replacement level, which is an average of just above two per woman. By the year 2000, those proportions have exactly reversed. Uh, if you count the large Indian states with below replacement level fertility, then about half the world's population live in regimes of below replacement fertility now, and only about 16% in four or more. So this is a profound change, not in my lifetime, but my children's lifetime, and I'm not an old man yet. Um, now, as Sakiko pointed out last night, the aggregate measures are very much affected by what's happening in, uh, in uh, India and China. But the fertility declines have started in most parts of the world. I'll skip over this except to note that these, uh, these are Asian and North African countries. A lot of them are Muslim countries. And one of the things that social scientists uh, had a lot of explanations for 20 years ago was, was why there was resistance to fertility decline in Muslim countries. Well, we don't write those things anymore. Be careful when you read any demography, check the publication date in the front, because uh, uh, everything's happened much faster than we predicted. Okay. How much of it collective action? Um, I, uh, I've made the point about we don't have an explanation for why. There, there's a story about each country, but uh, I won't give them all to you. Over half of all married women of reproductive ages in developing countries use some form of modern contraception now. This is, this is a huge change. It's the main explanation for the fertility decline in terms of how rather than why. Um, there's no doubt that the spread of modern contraception has made it possible for women and men to exercise choice about number as well as timing, and they do exercise that choice. The decline started everywhere except possibly in West Africa. The demonstration effect of the international family planning movement has been terribly important. We might date that movement to just about exactly 50 years ago in India. Uh, India was the first country to adopt a national population policy. And in 1953 in Calcutta, the um, 
uh, inter International Planned Parenthood Federation was formed as an initiative between Indian, British, and American uh, 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 individuals. It's had a huge influence. I've worked in it myself um, and, uh, and uh, have a lot to uh, say about that if we talk. Is the end in sight? Uh, yes and no is the, uh, is the short answer. One point that I would like to make is the speed of the decline matters a lot. First of all, it, there are many wise guys now publishing articles with, uh, uh, who are friends of mine, so I get to call them that, publishing articles with titles like The Population Implosion, as though you guys were wrong all along. Look, there's, you know, the problem is really population aging, and there's an end state to this. To which the answer is no, we were right all along. That that diagram Frank Notstein published in 1945 is what's happening. It's just we're farther along faster than anyone expected. The second is that, and that matters for all these other transitions, is that there's people don't realize the pace matters a lot. Telling us that Africa, Latin America, and Asia are going to end up with stable populations, uh, it it within plus or minus 10 years has a huge influence on the number of billions of people that is. The, if these transitions that, have, that are partly along finish at a fast pace or at a slow pace within historic experience will make a difference of nearly 3 billion people. So the wash is plus or minus the amount of people that lived on Earth when, when I was born. Um, three billion is going to make a huge difference to the possibility of another green revolution. Uh, you, you, it grew three billion in my lifetime thanks to a major effort and a lot of luck and a, and a hell of a lot of fertilizer. Um, we, we managed to feed that three billion people. Okay, the challenge to the green, to agriculture people is do that again. And this time do it without, uh, with, without the budgets we gave you for research before. There's no more Punjabs out there. Y you can't fit any more fertilizer into Chinese fields. So think of something else and, and do it in the next 15 or 20 years and get it implemented. Reversals. Um, I, I, I'll skip this, actually. The, could you uh, move to challenge? Is the end in sight? Did we have? Did I go out of sight? The end is not in sight. Yeah, there's 1.2 billion teenagers. If, if this is going on as we anticipate, uh, the, these are the three or four largest generations that will ever exist. I always use the example of kids born in the 1980s because three of them are mine. Um, but there's 1.2 billion of them. Uh, these, these generations are causing enormous strain. They're just now entering their childbearing years. They're causing a huge strain on the family planning and, and health services of all the countries in the developing world, and they have to run real hard to stay in the same place. Um, to conclude, some lessons or analogies. Um, one, one is that there, there's sometimes an argument about whether it was the curative and preventive services and the family planning programs, or people will discover this magic, it's mother's education. Just educate girls, that solves everything. Lots of historical reasons. It's not an either or. The, each is the reason why the other worked. Uh, and, and so the, the either or is, is simply wrong. We haven't talked about wars and revolutions, and I'd, I'd love to, if anyone's interested, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of, on both the mortality and the fertility side, triggers, uh, triggering events or, or new technologies or new management were spawned in periods of great crisis. Now, this is the world as, as I grew up in it rather than the world that I would like to have or, or want it to be, but there's, there's numerous examples and we could talk about those. And lastly, the, uh, and this goes a little bit against Paul's point about the, the sort of the drivers or culture and things like this and the, the proximate causes or these other things. And it was very much a social science attitude and the rest was, was first attitudes have to change, then other stuff can happen, first cultural institutions. 
In the demographic transition, what, what has been found is that attitudes and behavior changed rapidly, virtually in tandem. Uh, relevant attitudes crumbled as, as the behaviors changed and very quickly. It wasn't first do this, get everybody ready, then uh, invite them to the revolution. Uh, they, they happened uh, together. Which perhaps a final point and a final lesson is not to worry too much about social scientists. I, I started my career just in time to be one of the people explaining why these things wouldn't change fast enough. And I just managed to get in a couple publications before POW, it all changes. Um, the attitude I urge people to have towards um, social scientists is the same as the great financier J.P. Morgan had toward uh, lawyers when he got exasperated and said, damn it, I didn't hire you to tell me what I can and can't do. I hired you to tell me how to do what I want to do. And that's, that's our function. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I do apologize for having to rush, rush people. It's, it's not, not the part of the job I like. But we have a theme here, getting people to do what they want to do. Our, our last uh, speaker of this panel is uh, our own Cutler Cleveland here from Boston University Center for Energy and Environmental Studies. And he shall be speaking on energy transitions, past, present, and future. Thank you, Adil. Hello again, everybody. Um, Vaclav Smil was, uh, who I know many of you know, is one of uh, uh, the world's great energy scholars, was scheduled to be here, but his, uh, he's had to go back to Europe because of an illness in his family. So um, I'm stepping in, which is hopefully will be as proficient as uh, Adil was. I am talking about something that I do happen to know a little bit about. So. None of my students are shocked to hear that I'll be talking about, about energy. And certainly in the, th in the scheme of things, if we talk about uh, uh, demography and agriculture and public health, energy has been a, uh, the transition and changes in the types of energy people have used have been fundamental driving forces shaping uh, every aspect of human existence and fundamental shapers of uh, the environment as well. Um, if we can think of <clears throat> human development in these common three dimensions that we do, energy certainly plays a, a pivotal role in all of them. It is certainly a major driver of macroeconomic growth. Uh, it has been since time immemorial, and there's tons of evidence uh, by uh, economists, including work that Robert Koffer and I have done, which shows that energy prices, energy use are tightly linked to macroeconomic growth, unemployment, inflation, Perry Sadarsky at York, has shown quite clearly it drives stock market performance everywhere in the world. So it's an important motor for overall economic growth. And as we all know, it certainly is a uh, major driver of an environmental change at uh, local, regional, and global scales now in the case of, of climate change. And more recently, we've come to talk about energy as a, a, a fundamental uh, social force as well, that is, the provision of basic life support service, uh, education, clean water, and so on and so forth. They're clearly tied to the provision of quantities and qualities of energy which can, pro uh, which can provide them. So here we see that energy, uh, the transitions that we've seen in energy in the past have had fundamental transformations of these three dimensions. And certainly the transformations that we uh, are looking forward to either due to the impending economic depletion of fossil fuels or perhaps uh, more likely an environmental imperative such as climate change are going to drive transitions and are going to have uh, similar ramifications than uh, as they have in the past. There are lots of different energy transitions or transformations. Uh, I'm only going to talk in detail about a couple of them, but here are some of the uh, important ones that have occurred throughout human history. A major one is a shift away from living off the sun, the products of, of uh, photosynthesis, net primary production through food gathering and the collection of fuel wood to uh, non-renewable hydrocarbons. Coincident with the changes in the types of energy use have been changes in the types of energy converters that we have used to do work, to transform materials into uh, to goods and services. So the shift 
largely from animate sources where human beings and draft animals did most of the work to where inanimate energy converters such as the steam engine, the internal combustion engine, and later turbines uh, uh, were important. And that has, uh, has fundamental economic implications. Higher quality of energy, moving from wood to coal to oil to gas and electricity. And quality here, uh, I mean a, in a very specific economic sense. How useful is a heat unit of one of these types of energy in generating human well, in, in supporting human well-being? And there are vast differences in the quality of energy in that perspective. Greater net energy surplus, that is how much energy uh, society has to invest uh, in getting a unit of energy out. And fossil fuels in particular deliver a much larger energy surplus. If you think of Spindletop, uh, Texas, the first major oil field discovered in the United States, how much energy they used to discover four or five billion barrels, and the return on that was astronomical. And now we're talking about trying to replace gasoline with ethanol, and it's about an energy break even. So these are fundamental differences in the quality of energy sources that um, we're going to have to confront. Non-commercial to commercial, fuel wood uh, not traded in commercial markets, which currently power uh, a billion or so households on the planet, a shift to commercial energy traded in, in uh, formal markets. A shift from rural to urban, as we just heard, is a fundamental transition in energy happening. Uh, a transition in the demand for energy, originally in the south, and then as people moved out of the south to the north, uh, an industrialization took place, a shift in demand to the north, but now we're looking at another shift back for, to future demand coming increasingly from the south. Improved productivity of energy use. Energy is being used more efficiently to produce GDP or to light uh, uh, our homes or power our cars and so on. And finally, a decarbonization of energy. The amount of carbon uh, released per heat unit as we went through this energy transition there, it's similarly uh, the amount of carbon produced per unit of energy has, has gone down. So um, I'm going to talk <clears throat> about a couple of these transitions uh, in particular, and then look at some scenarios of the future that various people have uh, and organizations have generated, which pr paint very different pictures of what is technologically possible, economically feasible, and I would argue socially desirable. This is the energy transition that the United States went through. If you did this for the world, it would look pretty much exactly the same. Um, two major transitions that we see here. The first one, uh, moving away from animate energy converters and renewable energy sources, that is wood and animal feed, feeding all the draft animals, uh, so that by the uh, World War I, we were a largely a coal-driven economy. This is the Industrial Revolution. So by World War I, coal is generating close to three-quarters of our energy use. And then the second major transition occurred between uh, uh, the second, uh, First World War and the 1960s when oil and natural gas and uh, primary electricity uh, replaced coal. And uh, the magenta line on the bottom there, labeled electricity, is primary electricity. That's electricity from hydropower, nuclear power plants, and to a much lesser extent, photovoltaics and other, uh, other renewable forms. So we've seen these, these fundamental energy transformations, and of course accompanying these were changes in all those economic and social and environmental conditions that, uh, that I just described. Clearly the unprecedented economic growth that occurred after World War II was driven by the shift from coal to uh, oil and natural gas and primary electricity, which are fundamentally higher quality energy sources than uh, coal and certainly the uh, renewable fuels. So uh, in homage to Vaclav, I stole one of his graphs from one of his uh, excellent books. So those are the energy sources. These are the machines using those energy sources. And these uh, show changes in the global share of, of the amount of work done in a physical sense uh, in the global economy. So again, prior to the Industrial Revolution, animate energy converters, humans and draft animals converting renewable fuels. And then you have the Industrial Revolution where uh, the steam engine uh, rapidly replaced uh, water wheels and draft animals fundamentally altered the course of the economy. The draft animal, humans can generate about one-tenth of a horsepower. Uh, a draft animal is ten times more powerful than human, and steam engines uh, are hundreds or thousands of times more powerful. So the rate at which we could rip energy out of the earth and do stuff with it increased enormously. That's really what the Industrial Revolution, from a, a physical perspective, was, was all about. And then, then the internal combustion engine and uh, electric generators 
uh, came along so that uh, completing the second wave of, of that transition. Um, why is that important from an economic perspective in terms of, of wealth? Well, from a biophysical perspective, if you believe that your wage rate in general is somehow related to your productivity, and that's a matter of debate depending on what school of economics you come from, um, clearly these changes in the types of energy we use and the types of energy converters we use had a fundamental influence on uh, our affluence. If you go out there with a hoe or a pick and uh, you're a, a strong uh, adult male who can do sustained work at eight or ten hours a day, it's going to take about 400 hours to till a hectare of land. Now I give you a draft, an, a pair of, an oxen pair who can do work at uh, uh, ten times the rate, you're down to 65, now I give you some oil and an internal combustion engine and your rate of productivity skyrockets. And so if the fundamental transition that occurred in the Industrial Revolution was this huge increase in productivity uh, of labor enabled by these, uh, these energy transformations. And clearly, uh, one of the principal reasons why poor nations are poor is that they still use low-quality energy sources with animate energy converters. And there's a lot of reasons why that's the case, and I'm not going to go into those, but there's a certain biophysical underpinning to that. And certainly that is not lost on uh, those folks because uh, increase in access to higher quality forms of energy and more powerful energy converters is a principal goal of development in many regions. Of course, there's been significant environmental consequences to this, one of which is uh, climate change, uh, the familiar graph of the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere along the vertical axis rising from pre-industrial levels of 270 or 280 parts per million up to 370 or so now and climbing and all the implications that that has for uh, impending climate change. And this fundamentally alters our discussion about energy because uh, if we're going to be serious about stabilizing climate, we are talking about some almost astronomical changes in how we use energy to get carbon emissions down to some level where we can stabilize climate at only uh, a couple of degrees warmer than uh, it, it is today. And who knows what that might do. Another aspect of this energy quality, this is a, a diagram from Vaclav that I stare at all the time. And it, it's fundamentally important, I think. But I, I can't. I haven't. I haven't quite figured it out. So maybe you can help me. And this this speaks directly to this transition from a fossil to a non-fossil based economy. The vertical axis shows the, the power density of both energy production and consumption systems. So you remember power measured in watts is the rate at which energy is used per unit time. So it's a rate of energy use scaled by the area over which it happens. And the horizontal axis shows the, the absolute area. So we now have power generation systems, fossil fuel systems, oil fields and coal fields, and the, the power plants which convert those fuels into electricity that have power densities on the order of 10 to the 3 to the 10, 10 to the 4th. They have been, uh, so these energy conversion systems have been driven by these very energy dense, powerful sources of energy fossil fuels. We live in buildings like this and shop in supermarkets and have factories and so on that have power densities that are in the same range as these energy sources. Now we're talking about shifting to sources at the bottom of the graph with power densities of order of magnitude, orders of magnitude less than fossil fuels. And at the very least, I uh, not to rain on the technological optimist uh, parade, provides some fundamental constraints to a smooth transition to a non-fossil based economy. At the minimum, because of this explicit spatial component of this, it implies some fundamental restructuring of where people live in relationship to where they get their energy and where they, they work, I, I believe. I'll come back to that uh, a little later. Another one of these important energy transitions that I mentioned was productivity. At a macroeconomic level, you take the total amount of energy use by a nation, divide it by GDP, and you come up with uh, the energy GDP ratio. And for the US, it's shown here. This includes wood. And you can see that overall, uh, particularly in the last 30 years, uh, we've gotten much more efficient at converting energy into GDP. 
Now, there's a lot of exploitation, and this has happened in all, almost all industrial nations, and it's beginning to happen in many, uh, in, in some uh, developing nations. There's a lot of explanations for why this occurred. In many macroeconomic models, there's a parameter in there which is called autonom autonomous energy, e energy efficiency increasing. What is it called, Amy? I can't remember. Anyway, some parameter whereby, like manna from heaven, the economy as it develops automatically becomes more efficient at converting energy into GDP. The work that, that we've done, uh, Robert Kaufman, who was here, and some other folks have shown that it's been principally due to several forces. One is the shift from low quality to high quality fuels. Over this period of time, we've gone from wood to oil to coal to gas to electricity. And since energy in these things is me are measured in heat units, we're adding up all these different types of energy based on their enthalpy or heat. But all heat units are not equal, right? That's why we pay 10 times more for a heat unit of electricity than we do for a heat unit of coal. Why? Because electricity can do special things for us. And so this, one of the reasons why this thing has dropped has been that technical change, energy efficiency increasing technical change, has been finding ways to use higher quality forms uh, of energy to do work. We also find that real energy prices, particularly in the last 30 years, have, have had a fundamental uh, importance on draw, stimulating substitution of capital and labor for energy and also stimulating energy uh, conservation. So it's not autonomous technical change that does this. It's technical change of a certain character and nature. Here are some uh, north-south transitions. Uh, this is from uh, Arnold Grubler's group at EASA and the World Energy Council looking at uh, the north-south transitions and changes that are, are taking place. Uh, we've talked about population. I think their range, upper range of population there now, no one ever actually believes that we'll get hit 15 billion. Do, is that, isn't that true, John? That's, that's high. That's high. Anyways. Um, but if you look at energy in particular, uh, you can see that uh, in, in the coming, the projections for the future show that you know three quarters of the world primary energy demand are going to be uh, shifting to the to the south, which uh, poses some fundamental challenges on the choice of energy we system to use, and how do we finance this massive capital investment that's going to happen, and will the free market generate this type of transition uh, fast enough? if climate stabilization becomes a, uh, a principal issue. So I want to now just run through some scenarios. And I'm not uh, advocating any of these scenarios as my personal favorite. Um, I picked a range of scenarios, uh, some of which are, are well known, a couple of which probably are less well known. Just to think of, to raise some issues or implications about what the challenges and choices are when we uh, are thinking about the future. This is a, quite a well-known study by uh, the uh, International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis and the World Energy Council that was published in, uh, in 1995. And they ran through a number of, of scenarios. And now behind a lot of these uh, are, behind all of these are very important assumptions about population and economic growth. So I'll ha I'm going to refer to my notes here to fill you in on some of the drivers that produce these scenarios. They produce a scenario which, which uh, I call coal is king again. And this is in, in the light of any major policy intervention. And if, we, if climate stabilization does not become a very high political priority, this is uh, probably not an a, a unrealistic way in which things might go, because 90% of the reduced carbon left in the Earth's crust is coal. It's not oil and, ga it's not oil and gas. So there, we're, staring, we're staring at a lot of coal. So in this particular scenario, um, we have very high rates of, of economic growth and technical change. Free markets prevail uh, everywhere. There are no greenhouse constraints politically, which are, dry, forcing, uh, are forcing us away from non-carbon-based fuel. They have a population in 2050 of 10 billion people. Uh, GDP in 2050, global GDP is 121 trillion U.S. dollars. They're, we're now at about 30 trillion. Um, which produces a growth rate of about 2.5% a year, which is slightly higher than what we've had in the last, uh, the last 40 or 50 years. Per capita GDP is, uh, for the world is, uh, in 2050 is $10,000, and uh, that's for everyone. So you, you have this enormous economic growth driven by the use of fossil fuels, and everyone's rich, essentially. There's the distinction in the, between the developed and the developing world kind of disappears in this particular uh, scenario run. 
um, there's a, a, a continuous increase, decrease in the energy GDP ratio of 1% a year. So there's this autonomous increase in the efficiency of 1% a year, which I'm going to come, come back to. And there's pollution control technologies that uh, allow the other bad stuff from coal other than carbon and sulfur and nitrogen to be, to be scrubbed. And so you produce this kind of scenario where uh, we burn lots of coal. We also produce by 2050 15 gigatons of carbon. Uh, we, we're producing about six, six and a half now, and most people think we need to get several percent below six to stabilize climate. So. Um, it's not a carbon-friendly source. Oil and gas forever scenario is another one. Same economic scenario as the first one. In this case, uh, we essentially suck every micron of oil out of the Earth's crust, oil sands, oil shales, all the other forms of oil, and uh, convert that. And uh, we get 12 gigatons of carbon produced in, uh, in 2050. Then they, they produce something called their grand transition scenario. And here is, uh, this would be something more along the lines of one of those communities in the third column of Paul's group where the world now is, there's a high degree of international uh, cooperation. Uh, many policy instruments are adopted to deal explicitly with climate change. There's a carbon tax enacted which limits, uh, which makes fossil fuels more expensive. Those funds are transferred to the south to develop non-carbon systems uh, in the south. Um, Gross world, that tax pr produces a drag on economic growth in the north, so people are a little less rich in the long run, but uh, everyone is, is overall uh, better off. And carbon emissions uh, are about five gigatons. You can see here a, a significant expansion of, of solar and biomass relative to uh, the fossil fuels. Robert Williams uh, and his group, Amelia Reddy, Thomas Johansson, have produced a number of, of scenarios. Here's one, and they're hot on biomass. They think that biomass uh, provides a, a, an excellent uh, carbon neutral source of energy. So they've generated a scenario here uh, in a renewables intensive scenario where we have uh, a large share of final energy demand in 2050, which is about one and a half times the amount of energy that we consume today. A good chunk of that coming from uh, direct use of biomass, but also uh, renewable energy and hydrogen uh, to, uh, to generate electricity. Um, this looks, this takes their scenario and looks only at electricity generation, showing the number of uh, terawatt hours produced per year. And so out there on the far right, you can see a, a mix of fuels where at the top you have intermittent renewables and geothermal, that's, so that's a lot of uh, wind energy. And then uh, a good chunk of uh, biomass energy, they rely heavily on uh, improvements in gas turbine technology, uh, which is not subject to this, the kind of st uh, static uh, technical change that we now have with fossil steam turbines, which is a very mature technology. Gas turbines, they argue, have a lot of room for impro improvement, uh, and they have a lot of uh, not very much nuclear and very little coal. And they believe, they assume in this that all these new biomass technologies will come in at the same life cycle cost as conventional fuel systems today, and that the harvest of large amounts of agricultural and forestry re residues has no adverse significant environmental impact on the productivity of, of natural systems. Nuclear scenarios, this is a group out of uh, the Nuclear Science Institute uh, at the University of Grenoble, NIF, Necker et al., and they compare their scenarios to that coal is king scenario, and they envision a large-scale ramping up of, of uh, nuclear power, initially with uh, conventional boiling water and pressurized water reactors, and then that eventually, in 30 or 40 years, depletes all the uranium, then we move over to a breeder reactor systems, either a plutonium or thorium uh, type of systems. Um, you can see here in their scenarios uh, in the, what they call the nuclear intensive scenario and also one where they use a lot of nuclear power to generate hydrogen to fuel industry and transportation uh, where they have a, a huge expansion of, of electric uh, power plants. We're talking about 150 plants built per year uh, over a 30 or 40 year period. There now are about 350 plants in the world, I believe. Uh, one out of four of which are, are in the United States. So we're talking about 100 a year being added. Uh, and their, their particular argument is that if you want to get serious about carbon, 
and get down to uh, you know four, three, four, or five gigatons of carbon, then uh, you're going to have uh, the nuclear deserves serious attention. And we all know there are a lot of issues uh, with that. So let me kind of a whirlwind trip through some of these scenarios. Very, very large differences in what people believe is technically possible, economically feasible, uh, and desirable. Uh, one issue is that the investment costs here are huge, are huge. We're talking about anywhere, depending on who you read, between 30 and 100 trillion dollars of investment that has to be made in energy infrastructure uh, by 2050 or 2060. A lot of that is going to have to come from private markets. Energy projects in particular tend to have low rates of return. They tend to, tend to be viewed ris as riskier than by investors. So this is going to put a, place a significant strain on, uh, well, it leaves a lot of questions about the ability of capital markets to, to do this. Just look at the reluctance to build transmission generation capacity uh, here in the United States as one example. Equity issues are large developing appropriate types of energy technology and getting them distributed, particularly in uh, rural areas in developing nations, uh, is a, a fundamental equity issue that will uh, loom quite large. All these models assume this autonomous energy efficiency improvements of 1 to 2 percent a year. So that's what they uh, assume. So uh, at 1.5 or 2 percent a year, we're basic, by 2100, we're not, we're not using a whole lot of energy to produce, uh, to reach GDP. Now, on the other hand, you know, some of the, we've, we've been pretty good at doing it in the last 30 years, but we're going to have to, uh, going to have to uh, continue those rates of improvement for uh, a long time to come, which seems to me to be a bit, be a bit of a heroic assumption. Um, all models assume continuous and significant cost reductions for new energy technologies. All of these scenarios assume that the new nuclear generation, the new generation of nuclear power plants, the new biomass technologies, the new solar collectors are all eventually going to have life cycle costs that are no greater than current conventional technologies. You know, nuclear right now, if you include subsidies, is probably nine or ten cents a kilowatt hour at least. We're talking about baseload coal that's two or three cents a kilowatt. So um, there are some some significant challenges out there, and most notably, climate. If we're serious about climate, there's no way the market's going to get us there. I mean, there's too much cheap fossil fuel left in the Earth's crust. And so unless there is a significant commitment, overt commitment to reduce carbon, uh, it, it's not going to happen on itself. And so there are, to the extent that uh, climate change is, is a serious issue, then there's going to have to be significant international uh, cooperation and commitment to develop non-carbon-based sources of energy. Uh, in a, a, a relatively short period of time. So I'll stop there and hopefully leave a little bit of time for questions for all three of us. Yeah. John, could you and David come up? Yeah, we, we are running a bit late, but if I could ask the speakers to come up there, and I would suggest that we'll, uh, we'll extend into lunch just by a little. I'll, I'll, I'll just come, come to you in a sec. And uh, let, let me tell you the good and the bad news. The good news is you're going to have more time for questions the next two sessions. Uh, the bad news is that is because in each of the session, one of the speakers uh, will not be able to come. Fareed Zakria, who's the editor of Newsweek International, is following today's news rather than being with us to talk about tomorrow's news. Uh, in, in Asia, I'm told, and he sends his apologies. And Bob Costanza uh, is snowed in in Vermont, which is doubly bad news, not only because we miss him, but because if he's stuck there in Vermont, then soon enough we'll be stuck here, uh, though not hopefully too soon. <laughs> uh, on that happy note, uh, I'll, I'll take questions, and may I suggest that we take maybe chunks of four or five questions before you respond uh, in the interest of time. My own sense, adding on from the first session, was that the big lesson I learned was that in, in all these fields, uh, following on Paul, some transformation, some transition is inevitable. And each of the three speakers seem to say to me that all transformations are going to be traumatic, uh, that they will involve some very serious and some very difficult uh, policy choices. At least that's, that's what I got from, from this, which may be wrong. But maybe, may I take a few questions? Uh, Hasnath, Professor Hasnath. My name is Hasnath. I'm from Development Geography area. And my 
I congratulate Mr. Harda for his good paper. I have two small comments. One is that the role of religion, which is traditionally understood against the birth control and all this thing. The recent experience in Iran shows that despite the conservative social structure of the country, the birth rate has been consistently declining. And that has been declining for the last 20 years. They have made a tremendous progress. On the other account, in another Muslim populated religious country, Bangladesh, where Mr. Haga has visited, right? And a couple of papers I have seen by Rafiq Luda Chaudhary, Nishad Kamal, Jack Cordwell, Barkat Khuda, and that the transition has reached quote and unquote plateauing, right? So one is a more liberal democracy, more, more secular, right? Their transition has stopped or plateauing. Another is more conservative, but their declining has been. Right. So is it the religion or the use of the religion by the state and other machineries which eventually affect? That is my comment. And I have one small question that I didn't quite understand what you mean actually by byproduct. It is byproduct of what? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We'll, we'll take maybe two or three questions and then, then go around. Uh, anyone else? Up here? I'll address this one primarily to Cutler. Uh, uh, in the in the diagrams you showed, uh, the the range of possible energy futures, is it not on? Okay. Yeah, the range of possible energy futures is is dramatic uh, across those different scenarios, and I, I guess I'd I'd in, invite you to, if 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 you could to, to to talk a little bit about what you think the possibilities among across those are and and a little bit about how we, what, what forces could be used to intervene, uh, what levers we have in order to, to, to uh, direct futures across those scenarios. Mm -hmm. uh, Miguel, up here and then at the back. I would wonder about your insights about the spread of ideas in addressing the various questions you've raised. So for instance, Cutler, ended by saying there will need to be interventions in the market processes. Now that involves the spread of political will to do that. David, I'm wondering as an epidemiologist, how can the ideas, the viruses of ideas, be spread to accomplish what Cutler, I think, would like? We'll take one more at the back, maybe two more at the back, and then, then make uh, Hi, I'm Doug Starr at the uh, Medical and Science Journalism Center. I had a question for David to make sure I didn't misunderstood, understand. It sounded as if you characterized the quick quarantining of people after SARS as, as something ominous um, about the future of public health. And I thought I and the public had the impression that that was a, a triumph of public health for a quick global reaction to contain something. And I, I wonder if you could clear that up. Uh, let's take just one last one at the back and then go around with the panel. Uh, <clears throat> this is a question for Cutler. Um, I'm interested in this idea uh, that uh, we need market interventions. Uh, it, some other policy analysts have suggested that because markets have generally favored more efficient forms of energy, uh, that in a global capitalist system, inefficiency is essentially for losers, um, that the markets will take care of this problem and that decarbonization is in fact a byproduct of that process. So I, I'm curious to see sort of how you respond to that idea. Gentlemen. Uh, two questions, both of them are difficult. Uh, the first one, um, the spread of ideas versus the spread of uh, organisms, say. Um, they, they have very much in common. In fact, they've often been modeled in exactly the same way. Uh, and uh, there are ideas that are good and are ideas that are malignant. And they both spread with, uh, well, uh, I, I don't <coughs> know if they spread with equal facility or not. Uh, uh, I guess it depends upon the ground in which they, they fall. Uh, I, 
do epidemiologists have anything useful to say about that? I, I think the answer is that uh, people who study the spread of ideas have useful things to tell epidemiologists and probably vice versa. And we've been in hermetically sealed compartments from each other. And I think uh, we need to start breaking down those barriers. Um, interdisciplinary work is very hard. It's not multidisciplinary work, which is easy, but it's interdisciplinary. And I've, I've written some about the different models that different disciplines use, but suffice it to say, it's a not an easily solved problem. Uh, but could be solved by working on a common problem rather than trying to use different disciplines. Uh, Doug, you asked about um, SARS. Um, I don't know. I, I don't see this as a particularly great triumph of public health, the fact that we uh, you know, lock down hospitals and lock people up. There, there isn't actually a lot of evidence of the efficacy of that in those instances. Um, SARS uh, had a, uh, an economic effect way out of proportion to the number of people who were uh, afflicted by it. And um, I think that what we're going to see is that the, with the next SARS outbreak that people are going to be taking a very different uh, tack than the kind of draconian measures that were used in the last one. At least that's what the medical journals are saying now and that's what the Canadians are saying and I suspect that that's true. Um, what worries me and what I addressed in a truncated fashion in my talk was the effect this is having on the organization of public health. It's becoming a militarized command and control um, operation and I think it's having a baneful effect. Uh, I have a lot to say about that but not <coughs> enough time to say it. Thanks. And I, I must apologize. Uh, I realized when, when you mentioned byproduct of what, for pacing. I, I, uh, I had just finished boasting to David that I, I was really good at truncating things and getting them to fit exactly the amount of time on the fly, and then that disproved my contention. Uh, byproduct, uh, so I, what, what I was trying to do in the title was to play off design, you know, purposeful family planning programs, purposeful child survival in particular, but other public health campaigns as well, versus these changes, demographic changes happening as a byproduct of something else. And the main something else that I discuss and that, that uh, a lot of other people discuss is the spread of mass education and adult literacy. And that, I believe, was very important. And what I end up doing in the paper is making a plea for it wasn't one or the other. Each worked because the other was happening. And the synergistic effect was very rapid change in a lot of places. You mentioned Iran and Bangladesh. And they are sort of uh, very important cases for um, uh, the, the fact that, that no religion and no system of beliefs, it, it, in recent years we've talked about uh, Islam and, and how it's conducive to high fertility. When I first started reading stuff, it was Confucian ideology and it's conducive to high fertility and the rest. And there's a similar sort of, we, we've been wrong one after another. You, you named the religion and we will, uh, you know, you will find a 20 or 30 year old thing explaining why Catholicism is not conducive to low fertility and, you know, forget them all. Um, both Iran, Iran is very interesting. Right after the, the, the big, it was an example of a slow decline right up until the Islamic Revolution. Uh, when you, you, it started, there was a good family planning program, oddly enough, uh, but huge social change right after. Bangladesh, we forget now, in the late 60s, Pakistan had a serious, under Ayub Khan, serious uh, family planning program. The one in the 1970s that was brought in that started the tremendous, was, which was a complete, complete failure. Um, in 1970s, in Bangladesh, independent Bangladesh had a family planning program, much the same elements, many of the same workers rehired with World Bank money. Uh, which started a terrific sustained success that disproved an awful lot of the theories. What happened in between was uh, the biggest refugee movement after a short but, but incredibly vicious war, the biggest refugee movement of, of modern times. This, this is part of my point. There are other examples, Colombia after La Violencia, U.S. and France after their revolutions, very often the big changes in fertility have come shortly after an upheaval, 
And your example of Iran shows uh, that, that it almost doesn't matter what upheaval, it kicks away the, the social forces and, and things happen. That's, um, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Well, Barry, in terms of my, I guess you asked for my kind of musings. Um, I think we're going to burn lots of oil and gas, and I think the climate's going to warm. And I think we're going to be faced with, you know, having to adapt. There's, there's incredible inertia in the energy system. And oil, there's no substitute for oil in terms of what it, it can do, both as an energy and material right now, in my opinion, in terms of a functional economic equivalent. So I, I, I see us burning lots of oil and coal. I hope we don't burn a lot of I, oil and gas. I hope that um, we avert, I hope that uh, Sheikh Yamani's famous, now famous quote, that the Stone Age didn't end because of a lack of, stone, of stones, and the fossil fuel era will not end due to a lack of fossil fuels, that there will be some kind of, of intervention that will, will move us off that path. But I, I do see a lot of oil and gas. I don't see any, any way around it. Um, I'm less sanguine about biomass than Bob Williams. He and I argue about this all the time. I think harvesting of biomass has enormous environmental implications and biodiversity implications. Uh, removing forest residues and agricultural residues, which is what he's talking about. He's not talking about cutting new forests. He's talking about harvesting residues largely from existing lands and uh, forest plantations, which uh, actually can be okay, but harvesting agricultural and forestry residues has very important implications for soil fertility and healthy, uh, healthy ecosystems. Um, nuclear power, I mean, if we could solve all the problems, it would be great. <laughs> um, I think on economic grounds alone, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's toast. I mean, the subsidies are enormous. You remove the insurance indemnification, in the United States, it's gone tomorrow. The plant shut down. And we, we, we uh, do all the fuel processing. It's like if the federal government refined motor gasoline for Exxon, you know, no one had to pay for it. So when you add up all the costs, the real economic cost for nuclear, uh, it's very difficult to see those coming down significantly where it can compete uh, in, uh, in a free market. And then there are all the waste issues and those breeder reactor programs, you know, the, even, even though they breed fuel, produce waste uh, that are on the order of 10 to 50 times greater than the rate at which we produce waste today. So it's a, the waste disposal issue that looms alarm. I, I, to me, I think the issue is electrification, particularly in the developing world. Electricity, you need to skip, you need to, to the extent possible, uh, rely less on direct fuel and use uh, electricity. So here I think wind and photovoltaics and other renewable forms of electricity generation are, are paramount. And these have, have fundamental uh, changes in the lives of people in developing nations. It's not just you know having a light so you can have a, a basic appliance. It also has other implications because if the lights stay on at night, kids read more. If the lights stay on at night, that means a woman who weaves baskets for a living can work at night and earn a few extra dollars. And these have fundamental, and the whole village and country scales have fundamental differences on basic aspects of the quality of, of human life. So electrification, I think, both at a, at a macro level because it's such a high quality fuel source, but also on a household level is, is are things that we need to focus on. The second issue related to markets and efficiency, and I'm not sure I got the question, I think it was that basically the market as it's worked in the past century or so has produced this transition to higher quality fuel sources and lower carbon sources, which is true, but the carbon issue was only a secondary aspect of that. We made that shift because it offered fundamental economic advantage to shift to those higher quality for, uh, sources. They just happened to also have higher carbon to hydrogen ratios, a lower carbon to hydrogen ratio, so they produce uh, less carbon. But um, those same forces are going to fa continue to favor oil and gas and coal, and the markets are, in fact, very inefficient. There's a huge external cost associated. If climate change is, is real, there's a huge external cost that we're not paying. And so, you know, the idea of the, the tax is to in, 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 uh, internalize that cost somewhat and shift the force of the market towards uh, fuels that, you know, that, that don't have as much carbon. So. Um, the, energy markets are highly skewed with subsidies and, uh, and externalities that tilt the playing field in, in very specific ways right now. So, particularly in the case of carbon. I, uh, I, 
I'll take my prerogative as a share just to make one comment. It is interesting, uh, though, in, especially in light of the last comment, the question that comes to my mind is uh, we aren't going to seek an answer now, but, but we might want to mull over it over, over uh, lunch, is that is change going to come because we find a different source that enables us to do the things we do today, or is it going to come because we change our attitudes to start doing different things uh, through different sources? And, and it is interesting in the three stories, at least in the first two, uh, the stories are as much about changing attitudes in conjunction with changing technology. Uh, uh, whereas, whereas with the energy one, I wonder whether it's, it's simply an energy thing and what will it take for us to sort of maybe change uh, the way we use energy? Uh, would it take a different way of how cities are planned, uh, how suburbs uh, arrive, how we work, and so on and so forth? But uh, to me, it's been a very, very rich, uh, rich session because it raises questions like that. I, I would like to thank all three, all three uh, of the panelists for for a wonderful, uh, wonderful set of presentations. Uh, we uh, will break for lunch now, which is served right here in the in this room at the back. It's it's buffet, so if you can uh, take it and eat here. In about half an hour, we'll have a short uh, demonstration of uh, of a Boston University. Party Center project on human development, and we will reconvene, uh, which which we will we will have as you have lunch, and then we will reconvene at around uh, maybe 1:45 uh, uh, for the third session. Again, my thanks to all of you.